what we're going to do here before cocktails and make you take a little content before we move to cocktails is hear from uh, hear from a man who is uh, a part of a company that I think has been at the forefront of the of discussions in, in the last couple of years about the ethical use of technology. That's Microsoft. The man is Brad Smith, who is the president and chief legal officer. He's all, also author of a new book, Tools and Weapons, The Promise and Peril of the Digital Age. Please welcome him to the stage, along with Adam Loshinsky. Thank you, Alan. Good evening, everybody, and, and welcome, Brad. Thank you. Great to be um, here. Great to see everybody. We, um, we, Brad and I have a lot of ground to cover, and so, uh, but after an appropriate amount of time, I would really appreciate it if those of you who are itching to get into the conversation simply raise your hand. I'll recognize you and, and get into the into the conversation. Um, for anyone, Brad, who's followed business over the decades, let alone the technology business, it's a very interesting moment for Microsoft, which is not only one of the most admired companies in, in anywhere, but all of a sudden, one of the better liked companies, I, I, I think, as well. And you, you wouldn't, one wouldn't have said that a couple decades ago. I think you wouldn't dispute that, right? I would not dispute that. I, I, looking back a couple of decades ago, I was at the company a couple of decades ago. I've been there for 26 years. And so now you as the president are in this interesting place, I think, where you are involved in not only the core business, but many issues that affect the company and companies everywhere. And so I have a list that I'd like to go down. And I'd like to start not with technology, but maybe with a surprising issue for some of the people in the room, which is housing. Tell everybody Microsoft's position on housing. Well, we did something that was definitely unusual for us. Uh, in January, just five months ago, we came forward and made a $500 million investment in the Seattle area to invest in affordable housing in the region. Uh, it's not all philanthropic. In fact, it's mostly not philanthropic, although in part it is. Uh, but you know, we looked at the situation in the region and in Seattle, as in San Francisco, and in some other cities, we've just seen the influx of people far outstrip the supply of housing. Uh, and as we dug into the issue, what we saw was a visible homeless population. But in many ways, that's the visible tip of the iceberg. There is a shortage of low-income housing. There is a shortage of middle-income housing. Uh, and what we really did was focus on two things. One was bringing some capital. Uh, obviously, you've got some tech companies where one of them that has a very nice balance sheet. We've got capital that we can deploy in this way. Uh, and so we're putting 475 of that $500 million into loans and other investments to try to help stimulate more housing supply. But in many ways, I would say as or even more important than that was a partnership with uh, a local business group. Uh, we persuaded the mayors of nine cities around Seattle to sign up and pursue the kinds of public policy reforms that are going to be needed to really enhance the housing supply. And hopefully, over time, this will stimulate more action. More action will be needed to really address what has become a growing problem. And I want to I pause on this notion of the balance sheet. And I'd like you to share with everybody the conversation that you had on the management team where you made a decision that most companies say, well, we're certainly going to advocate on policy, and maybe we'll even give away some money. But you said, no, we're going to invest as opposed to give away, which I think, is res which I think resonates with what we're trying to accomplish here, which is how does business do good, but not necessarily just by being charitable. I think the, uh, the, this aspect has two or three pieces to it. One was a conversation that took place with about 10 business leaders in Seattle last June, almost exactly a year ago. Uh, Satya Nadella and I were both there. And the group was talking about the priorities for the business community for the next five years. We started with the issues that we at Microsoft and others have particularly championed over the last decade, namely education and transportation. But the more we talked about it, the more we came to the view that housing has really become a third issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, and so we started to think about what we could do. Uh, the second part of the conversation was really not surprisingly with our board of directors. Uh, if you're going to deploy, and at this point it was more you know, in the $250 million range, that kind of money, 
you better have your board of directors on board and understanding what you're doing. And the case that we made, the case which- Excuse are, me for interrupting you. Another, what you're saying is that even uh, Microsoft cares about how it invests $475 million. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, and, and the case we made, which everyone uh, on our board appreciated, was you can't really have a healthy company without being in a healthy community. Uh, you've got to have places for your own employees to live. But more than that, you really want a community. Your employees want a community where the school teachers can live, the first responders can live, the nurses can live. Uh, and what we've seen in Seattle is so many of these people being pushed farther and farther away and enduring commutes of 90 minutes or more every day. Uh, and so the board recognized that this was something that was sensible for Microsoft to do. And then the third piece of this is something I give a huge credit uh, to Amy Hood, our CFO, and our treasury team. Uh, because they have a large portfolio, they have literally for decades, and it has included some investments in the housing area. So they were able to build on the expertise they had, the experience and insights they had, including on the region, and they were able to come back and say, we like this, but instead of doing 250 million, let's do 500. Uh, and so it was a wonderful partnership internally that made it possible for us to raise our ambition. And I want to flag for everybody, tomorrow morning I'm going to be speaking with Professor Rajan from the University of Chicago, whose whole thesis, he's an economist, but his thesis is around community, which is what you're addressing here. You could easily say we're a global company, which we are, and we have to pay attention to all these other global issues, mm -hmm. but uh, you're, you are paying attention to your community. So we'll, we'll address whatever you like to address, but let's keep moving and talk about another unusual or, or unique thing that Microsoft is doing around the area of secondary education. Yeah, well, what we did really uh, you know, in this year, another sort of event in 2019, uh, was we decided to champion legislation that would raise business taxes. Uh, Hold on, Brett. I'm sorry. You said... <laughs> Microsoft is championing raising business tax. Yeah, I know, and it, it was something we did with a huge amount of thought and a little trepidation. Uh, the specific issue actually was post-secondary education opportunities. Ah, post-secondary. Yeah, and you know, we recognize that we have a business community in Washington State, like everywhere, that is critically dependent on skilled people that come out of our universities, increasingly community colleges, other post-secondary training opportunities. And in our state, as in most states, this was underfunded. Uh, and so the question was put specifically to us and specifically to me, would I partner with the president of the University of Washington and propose legislation that would address this? And I definitely had some questions and concerns. I wanted to make sure that it was going to be spent well, that the money wouldn't be diverted during the next recession, uh, that it was going to be spread broadly and not just go to four-year degrees, but community colleges as well. Uh, and so what we ended up proposing and what the legislature enacted was a new dedicated fund. It raises an additional $200 million per year. It opens the gates in terms of additional financial assistance for people of lesser means to be able to, to go get an, a, a higher education. And what it did is it took one of our taxes. There is, in Washington State, what's called a business and occupation tax. It's a B&O tax. Other states often have it. And the rate for services was 1.5%. Uh, it was, two decades ago, 1.8%. And uh, we said it should be raised back to 1.8% to raise the money for this. But the other thing that we did, and this is, was the interesting discussion, it was really Amy Hood and me inside Microsoft, we said, look, if we're going to raise this, if we're going to argue that lawyers and dentists and small businesses pay this, we better raise our taxes more than theirs. Uh, and so what we proposed and what was adopted was a graduated rate. For most businesses, it goes up to 1.8%. For a certain uh, category of companies with revenue uh, up to $100 billion uh, uh, per year, say 200, uh, 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 so I guess it's 25 billion to 100 billion, it goes to 2%. Above $100 billion a year, there's two companies in Washington state that would hit this, Microsoft and Amazon it goes up to 2.5% with a, a minimum and a max. And, and I called around. You know, I called other business leaders. 
And I said, hey, we're thinking about this. What do you think? Uh, and you know, by and large, people said, you know, we get it. It's a good idea, and especially with you all willing to you know, pay a higher rate than anybody else, uh, we can get behind this. And it, it passed. And uh, was Amazon supportive of this? Amazon became supportive of it. <laughs> I know it was terrific. I mean, they, they, they had to work through what it meant for them. And, uh, you know, we were at the forefront of the idea. And whenever you're the second person to get the idea, you're going to be a little more cautious. They, did, they, they were fantastic in Olympia. And, and I don't think we would have done it without uh, their support as well. I don't think it would have gotten through. OK, great. Let's leave the Puget Sound area and, yeah. and the state of Washington and go to the technology world. Um, you personally and Microsoft has staked out a position on how we should be thinking about artificial intelligence. Uh, to start high level and tell everybody the initiatives that you've been working on, and then we can dig deep a little bit. Well, the first thing I would say is this is an area that has been evolving very rapidly, and it's pretty interesting to see how far it has gone in just the last 18 months. Uh, a year ago in January, we published a set of six principles that we said we thought we needed to follow and others should consider ethical principles for artificial intelligence. Uh, and if you look around the world, look at other companies, uh, you know, many are adopting principles. And I think the good news is they're all relatively similar, thank goodness. Uh, what it has now meant is many things. First, we're having to implement the principles. Uh, and that requires a whole host of business processes and then ultimately technology automation in a tech company uh, to make these effective. Second, it actually requires that you live up to your principles. Uh, so one of the things that people have been particularly interested in is you know, when have we said no? Uh, and I've talked uh, you know, some about some of the deals where we've said no, specifically in the facial recognition space turned down a deal with the California Law Enforcement Agency where we thought that there would be a risk of bias that would lead to people of color being arrested when they shouldn't be. Turned down a deal in an authoritarian regime that proposed to deploy facial recognition in a broad-based way that we felt would open the door to the abuse of human rights. In California, did they end up going with a different vendor? This was the most interesting thing. The answer is no, they did not. As you can imagine, it is not in the DNA of a typical sales force to say, let's turn down a deal. And it's especially challenging when you have salespeople that have worked considerable time to develop that deal. And then the first response you hear is, wait a second. If they don't buy from us, they're just going to go over to Amazon, or they're going to go to Alibaba or somebody else. And the most interesting thing is we went to the law enforcement agency in California. We said, look, this technology is not suitable for this purpose at this time. We said, if you look at the performance of facial recognition systems, our system is actually at the very top by all objective measurements recently completed by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. What we're saying is you shouldn't buy from us. We won't sell to you. But you shouldn't buy from anybody else either. And you know what the response was? It was, you guys just did us a favor. Thank you. Because we would have deployed something that probably would have created problems for ourselves with our public. And let's work together to improve this technology as it goes forward. It's, you hope, that you, you, and, the, and your assumption is you'll have another shot at this. We know they, they didn't go to a competitor. Interesting. And which authoritarian regime did you turn down? One that I'm not going to share with you. Great. <laughs> and the city of San Francisco recently proactively banned I, that's not the right word. No, I put Tell a moratorium. This, yeah, yeah, yeah. Explain what this. Well, the, the other thing that's interesting, I think there's three things quickly worth noting about facial recognition. First, I think it's becoming sort of the first specific, concrete application of artificial intelligence, where you're seeing real controversy, uh, and therefore it's becoming a test bed for how governments will think about regulating it. Second. Uh, we ourselves at Microsoft proposed regulation of this technology last July, just 11 months ago. We said because of the risks of bias, issues around privacy, democratic freedoms, this needs to be regulated by the law. And 11 months ago when we did that, we got feedback and sort of blowback in Silicon Valley. What's wrong with you guys? You must be behind. Why do you want the government involved in this? 
And then within less than a year, the city next to Silicon Valley enacted this new law. And what the law does is it imposes a moratorium on all public sector use in San Francisco by the city of facial recognition technology. I think that's a bit of a challenge in its own right because ultimately there are beneficial uses of this technology. It is being used to help diagnose certain diseases. It is being used to reunite you know, people who have gone missing with their families. Uh, you know, it will be used in appropriate and important ways to keep the public safe. So you know, a moratorium is one thing, but ultimately you've got to make decisions. Cities, states, countries are going to have to make decisions. How does it want this technology to be used? And so I, I envision that Microsoft will be part of a group that will go to jurisdictions like the city of San Francisco and say, let's talk about this and figure out how you can implement this technology. How long is that conversation going to take, do you think? While under, you, I think you've sort of alluded to the fact that the Chinese and others are implementing, 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 right? Yeah, well, and of course, right now, this technology, except for the city of San Francisco, is unregulated in the United States as well. It's mostly unregulated in the world, although certainly in Europe, it is uh, subject to the, the general privacy laws that are there. Um, I think it's something that needs to move forward faster rather than more slowly. Uh, we proposed legislation. We took uh, a draft uh, of legislation to the Washington uh, Senate and House. It got through the Senate but died in the House. We, you know, we're, I'm basically traveling the world, among other things, encouraging governments to start legislating. And our basic proposition is, look, you can't answer yet every question that the world is going to need to answer in the future, but there are some questions that we believe can be answered clearly now. I'll give you one example. Right now, there's no legal requirement that somebody who enters the facial recognition business needs to make their service available for testing. Mm. So you don't have a consumer reports, you don't have academics that can test these services for bias, and yet there's documented instances of facial recognition being biased against women and people of color. That's the kind of bias that can result in adverse decisions being made that impact people's lives. So one of our proposals has been, look, if you want to participate in this market, you should have to make your service available for third-party testing in an objective way. That's what automakers do. That's what drug makers do. It's widespread throughout our society. And I'm hopeful that we'll get at least one major jurisdiction somewhere to pass that. All it takes is one because if it's available for testing somewhere, huh. the results will be readable everywhere. Before I open this up, I'm gonna ask you the, I'm gonna ask you the first of two uh, open-ended questions. We, approximately how long will it take for there to be meaningful regulation of AI in the United States, to begin at least? I think we're gonna see the initial forays, perhaps more uh, at the state level, to some degree other municipalities, over the next couple of years. Uh, I think we're going to see you know, increasing congressional hearings even this year. Um, I don't know that we're going to see any legislation at the federal level between now and, say, 2021. But this is coming, and it's going to come in a variety of specific forms, and it may come in some general form as well. Um, the technology is so impactful. It is so beneficial, but also so challenging um, that I, I think that we're seeing very quickly uh, uh, an interest in having it be subject to the rule of law. Second question, you are one of the world's foremost experts on how antitrust policy affects the technology industry. What do you, for, how do you forecast this will play out over the next several years? Well, the first thing everybody should know is that's Adam's uh, very polite way of saying, you are a graduate of the School of Hard Knocks. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, Fair enough. and I can say that I was the general counsel of Microsoft <laughs> when we set the record for the biggest antitrust fine uh, by the Europeans in the early 2000s. And then I was the general counsel when we beat our own record with an even higher fine. Congratulations on that. Uh, then Intel and Google beat us. So you know, I, I have been around the antitrust area for a while. Um, I think you can say a few things. First, obviously, the, uh, the public atmosphere has changed really quite remarkably. And quickly. Yes. And you know, it used to be that you, you know, would, would say, I'm from the tech sector, and everybody would say, oh, that's great. 
you know, tech is fantastic, and you know, that's not the public mood in a great many places in 2019, and we just need to recognize that. I think that's going to have a number of ramifications. First, I think you're going to see more scrutiny of mergers uh, by uh, large tech companies, especially if they're number one in a market and they're buying another company that's number one in a market. Uh, I think, if anything, one of the uh, focuses of current antitrust discussion is some level of remorse in some circles, at least, about some acquisitions that were approved in the past. So I think antitrust regulators are going to certainly want to take more time and exercise more scrutiny. The most popular ones you're referring to are the, uh, the billion-dollar acquisitions that Facebook did over the last five years or so. Yeah, there's definitely, you know, the, the, that, that's definitely uh, on the list. Instagram, what's that? Yeah, in a, yeah, in a, in a prominent way. And, and so people are, are talking about that. Uh, second, I think there's a, a, a renewed focus on so-called platforms, operating sy systems being one of them. Uh, Spotify has a very well-publicized formal complaint against Apple now in the European Commission. And this will be the first, I think, real case uh, to assess how uh, operating systems use app stores. Uh, because back in the Windows days of the 1990s, you didn't see app stores. And when you think about it, you could, anybody could put a browser on an operating system. You know, increasingly, you've got to go through the terms and conditions and pricing of an app store to get your app into the hands of a user. Third, I think there's a, a, a focus on what some people have called aggregators more broadly. In, in the tech area, an aggregator, as the people have developed this, is really considered to be somebody who has a direct relationship with the user, who has these services that are available from other parties, that has no cost of distribution, uh, but has a very powerful network effect, especially when they're also an advertiser in addition to, in effect, a distributor. Uh, and you're starting to see uh, academics and you're starting to see regulators focus on this. So you know, for, for anybody who thought that antitrust had sort of abated a bit, uh, you know, I, I think there's going to be more work uh, for more people who, who I want to go to law school and study antitrust, <laughs> let me put it that way. And, and I'll point out the deafness of this, this man who just pointed out three areas of increased uh, antitrust scrutiny, none of which will focus on, on Microsoft particularly. Well, we have, apps, we, we have app stores too. Right, but not of the size of, of the competition. No, but we, but, we have, but we do have to be mindful. Un you know, we, uh, we have a couple of areas where it does matter. And, and only in the interest of time, t yes or no, will what, what is known as hipster antitrust, you know, redefining antitrust, away from prices and on competitive behavior, will that happen? Will that come to fruition? I think yes to some degree as people uh, recognize that data is in effect a form of currency the, uh, and uh, therefore uh, uh, they can look at it in a way the traditional pricing theorists might have. Very interesting. A couple quick questions, please. Just look for you. Yes, over here, please. Uh, uh, there's a microphone will come your way. Please uh, introduce yourself. David Grain, Grain Management. Um, as the US government, particularly uh, from the standpoint of intelligence, is way behind in cyber warfare, being prepared for what may come, how does the US government uh, have a constructive antitrust and regulatory relationship with the big tech companies when we're really gonna need the help of the big tech companies in order to sort of advance the cause? Great. Um, it's an interesting question, and I guess the first thing I would say is um, life is long and it's a little bit complicated. <laughs> uh, and no, you, you just think about the, if you think about the tech agenda from a policy perspective these days, it's incredibly varied. You know, and it starts with issues like cybersecurity, for example, and privacy and, 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 and digital safety. It includes you know, artificial intelligence, and it includes the impact of technology on, on jobs, it includes things like antitrust. And I don't think anybody can you know, go into the future and just say, you know, er, you know, in order to work together on one thing, you've got to agree on everything. Mm. Uh, you know, we've confronted this uh, you know, quite squarely uh, as we've dealt with immigration issues with the Trump administration. And, you know, we brought a lawsuit to stand up for our DACA employees, uh, for example. And at the same time, we've worked with the White House on cybersecurity. So your example is really apt. Uh, we've worked with the First Lady on her Be Best campaign in digital safety. And when people ask me about this, including our employees, I always explain our philosophy is, at least to ourselves, straightforward. 
We will partner where we can, and we will stand apart where we should. And we're never going to withhold support for the United States government on cybersecurity because we disagree on immigration or we disagree on you know, something like antitrust if that were to come to pass. Uh, I just think you, you have to be able to compartmentalize different issues at least to some degree. And that's most uh, important in two situations. One is when the safety and interests of your customers are at stake, which is the case for issues, I would argue, uh, for privacy and cybersecurity and digital safety, or where the national security of the country is at stake. And yeah, I just think if we were to say, we're not going to help on cybersecurity because we disagree on antitrust or immigration is almost irresponsible. Uh, you know, I, I, I just think we've got to be mature enough as a company and as an industry to be a little more multifaceted. Brad, before we go, Alan mentioned that you have a book coming out. Will you hold it up and tell everybody in the room one reason why they should buy 100 copies for their employees? <laughs> well, if you are a, interested in technology or if you are a company that uses technology uh, or if you know anyone who has a smartphone, <laughs> This book is for you. <laughs> and the, uh, tools, tools, tools and weapons, weapons out in September. Brad Smith of Microsoft, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.